During the Ultraman franchise's dark period in the 80s and early 90s, there weren't any new shows. So, Tsuburaya Productions teamed up with companies like Bandai to produce a lot of media involving the giants of Nebula M78. And this included video games. There were an alarming number of SD games released around this time, as in ones where one or several Ultraman are in chibi form. I don't quite get it. Rather fittingly, with the content of the series, a giant superhero fighting monsters, one of the first video games to bear the Ultraman name was a primitive fighting game for the MSX. And by primitive, I mean... It wasn't until the 90s when games like Street Fighter II redefined what made a good fighting game that Ultraman would finally have games more closely resembling what we would consider a fighting game. And a lot of them weren't very good, at least during this period. Today I want to take a look at three titles made for the Super Nintendo, or Super Famicom, since two of these were Japan exclusive. If I'm right in my assumption that Wikipedia is lumping in the release date of the Japanese Ultraman game in with the article about Ultraman Towards the Future, then that means the former released mere months after Street Fighter II hit arcades. With that in mind, and considering games were a lot quicker to produce back then, I don't doubt that Street Fighter II possibly influenced both of these Ultraman games. But, with both being clunky pieces of crap, I also don't doubt that the original Street Fighter had a stronger influence on them during development. You know, the bad one. What strength? But don't forget, there are guys like you all over the world. The first game here, simply titled Ultraman, has an arcade version that has some differences from its console counterparts. Yes, counterparts, plural. There's a Mega Drive version, but it's basically identical to the Super Famicom version, aside from some crappier controls. So I'm not gonna talk about it. Anyways, the arcade version features a slightly different monster lineup with Antlar and Naranga being exclusives. There are also two Balton fights in this because the show had two appearances of Balton, but unlike the show, the two Baltons here have the same design. There are a couple slightly different finishers in this version. Here you douse Jamila with water to replicate his death in the show. As far as the console and arcade differences go, that's basically it. They're the same crappy game. There are minor differences across all three games, some pretty major differences in the last one, but I'll go through the mechanics they all share here. As an Ultra, a giant defender of intergalactic peace, you battle through a gauntlet of foes from their respective shows. As far as faithfulness to the source material goes, all three games do the job more than adequately. There are background elements in the stages you fight on that make me go, oh yeah, I remember that from that episode. I like that. The actual game feel here is pretty stanky. Across all three titles, you're afforded a basic moveset. A punch, a kick, a jump kick, a high jump kick, a backflip, and a barrier move that occasionally reflects projectiles, depending on the type. You fight against the stage's monsters until their health reaches zero, but it doesn't end there. Simultaneously predating Mortal Kombat's fatalities and emulating the outcome of fights in the series, you have to finish off the monster with a level 4 special attack, which is executed when a meter that gradually fills up over the course of the fight reaches its peak. Sure, you can do three other special attacks, but the final one is the only one that can kill the monster at the end. The monsters, though, they're not held down by the same restrictions, and they can do their special moves whenever they want. So that, combined with their often erratic and janky movements, means the player is at a severe disadvantage. Unless they cheese the fight with the stanky kick, but that doesn't always work. Sometimes the monsters dodge your special attacks too, which is really dumb. If the monster somehow gets behind you, it's problematic trying to turn around to face them. The health comes back over time too, for both you and the monster, so you gotta be careful and make sure to double tap so the monster stays in finish mode. There's also a 3 minute time limit across all three games, and I like how it's themed after the mechanics of the show. Your color timer starts beeping once you reach the final minute, and that's also when the pinch music starts playing.
There are also points you get from a time bonus and how much health you have remaining. And these are very important because getting 50,000 points nets you a continue. It's 100,000 points if you're playing Ultra 7. Continues are incredibly important if you're playing these games without save states because all three games can be brutal, often for reasons relating to the game feel. Yeah, the big elephant in the room, all three games do not feel great to control. You don't feel like you're controlling a powerful, battle-hardened giant of light, and more like you're controlling a man with arthritis who made the very ill-advised career move of becoming a wrestler. Most of your attacks don't feel good to land, and the most consistently useful strategy across all three games is the high jump kick. There are some differences that start to crop up, so I guess I'll start looking at them individually, starting with the game based on the 1966 Ultraman series first. Once again, this is a console port of the arcade version. Out of the three games here, I think this one is the closest to capturing the experience of removing a toenail in video game form. Though it's not a completely awful time. There are aspects of the presentation I like. Despite its rather tinny musical compositions, it does try to replicate the music of the show. The fight against Jamila is also suitably sad in its conclusion. Sadly, most of the fights in this game are a chore and needlessly frustrating. Again, your opponent can dish out as many special moves as they want for no energy charge, unlike you. Your barrier attack can only reflect, like, two projectiles in the entire game, so it's not very helpful. You might as well just jump over them. Most of the early game enemies can be dealt with by spamming your stanky leg attack, but the first big wall is the fourth stage boss, Bolton. It rolls around everywhere. It teleports when you attack it while it's waving its antenna. It saps your health, and the only way to get out of it is to mash buttons. It sucks. I hate it. Normally, I have a hard time against him, but I got surprisingly lucky when getting footage for the fight, so, you know, happy that turned out well. I don't know if this is Stockholm Syndrome, but the best fight in the game, I think, is the Mephilus one. It's fast and frenetic, and the music here is pretty cool. <laughs> You're basically in a mirror match. Mephilus has a lot of the same moves you do and falls over just as easily. It's a surprisingly fun fight in a game full of bullshit fights. The hardest, fittingly, is against Zeton. And not in a fair way. He keeps teleporting out of your stanky leg and basically your entire moveset can be countered at any time. It's not fun. I think the strategy here is to attack when he attacks because that's when he's most vulnerable, but it's incredibly inconsistent. It's one of the most unfair final bosses I think I've ever seen. You know those continues I mentioned? The ones that, if you were playing fairly, you would have very little of right now? Well, after Zeton redirects your finisher back at you, you have to do this little mini-game where you fire the rocket at Zeton that kills him in one hit. You know, like in the show. <laughs> the worst part about that is the number of chances you have are based on how many continues you have left. So you better make your shots count, or it's back to the title screen. <laughs> But yeah, Ultraman for the Super Famicom is the absolute worst of the three games here. It's a true kusoge, as the Japanese say. The faithfulness to the source material is appreciated, it looks and sounds the part, but the gameplay here really kills it. In honesty, it took me three separate sessions to get 30 minutes of footage for it. It's that painful to play. It's not fun, the challenge feels unearned, it is not a very good video game. Moving on. Our second video game, Ultraman Towards the Future, was based on the then-recently produced Australian TV series of the same name. The show was actually pretty underrated, check out the video I did on it, or watch the show itself. But the game, which was released around the launch window of the Super Nintendo in the West, isn't a worthy companion piece. Now 
Now, something to note right off the bat is that Ultraman Great here has a lot more animation than the herky-jerky motions of his Japanese counterpart. Attacks feel a little slower, but that, combined with some more vibrant graphics, makes this a step up in presentation. The music is also quite good, too. A lot of it is kinda sorta remixes of music from the show. It almost sounds like it, but not quite, but it's still alright on its own. The controls and moves you can do are largely the same, and this game introduces more moves you can pull off by holding up on the D-pad, turning your ballerina kick into a slightly less useful ballerina kick, and your dinky punch into a dinky uppercut. Again, you're better off just using the basic kick here. Due to better enemy design, this game is actually somewhat easier than its Japanese counterpart. But that doesn't stop it from having a lot of the same frustrations. Like the Super Famicom game, you get staggered way too easily. So the incredible silver giant you're playing as will repeatedly land on his ass. It's just embarrassing. I can't imagine any kid playing this thinking Ultraman is this cool property they need to check out. They also used the wrong names for a couple kaiju. The kaiju originally named Gazebo is now named Zebakin, and Dagunja is now Dagola. Those names are so off, it's not even the usual problem of the L and R being switched around when it's translated to English. This is more than a simple translation issue. I don't even know what happened here. I actually don't have much else to say about this one. Despite a new coat of paint and some better fights in general, it's more or less another version of the same crappy game. It's not like the next game, which actually introduces enough new stuff to warrant discussion. The third and final Ultraman game I'll be looking at is Ultra 7, based on the 1967 successor show to the original Ultraman. And for this one, it seems like the people at Bandai actually took the time to improve the experience. Probably realizing nobody used the punching button, attacking has been consolidated to one button. You punch with a basic input and do a high kick by holding up. The kick is much less useful in this game and has way less reach, but both it and the punch come out at faster speeds and don't leave you vulnerable like before. You can still do a high jump kick, and I swear it got a buff here because it's so much more viable and not unwieldy. In the first Ultraman game, you kind of were at the mercy of the physics as you came down. It was improved slightly for Towards the Future, but here you can just control it way better. Doing backflips actually gives you more distance from the opponent this time around. The barrier move in this game actually reflects more than, like, two projectiles in the game, so it's very useful for reflecting bosses' moves back at them. The big finish graphic now flashes when you have the fourth and final special move prepared. The varied finishing attacks from the arcade version of the first game are brought back here, with Ultra 7 either firing his wide shot beam or throwing his eye slugger, depending on the opponent. Stages now begin with cutscenes featuring digitized screenshots from the show, and the music is a decent facsimile of Toru Fuyuki's iconic score. There are even bonus stages where you can control the Ultra Hawk and get points for continues. These stages are okay, but they're definitely no Gradius or whatever else came out around that time. That said, in nearly every way, this is a massive improvement over the previous two games. But I still can't in good faith say this is a good video game. It doesn't quite stick the landing. While the controls don't feel as imprecise, the gameplay is still a little too floaty, and Ultra 7 is just as frustratingly fragile as his two other video game predecessors. Another thing I forgot to mention is the ability to use Ultra 7's capsule monsters, Agira, Miklas, and Windom. You can summon them at the start of the fight, and their health depletes rapidly, but it gives you the opportunity to whittle down the opponent's health before going in as Ultra 7. This sounds great on paper, and taking a rarely used mechanic in the show and turning it into a gameplay one is cool, but you really need to know the kaiju matchups before you send them in. Against certain opponents, the capsule monsters can get taken down laughably quick, 
and they don't last long enough to use their special moves, meaning you can only do basic punches and kicks. Pretty accurately to the show, I found that Windom is an absolute joke and should never be picked. But Agira's tail whip attack makes it the most powerful of the bunch. It turns the King Joe fight into a total clown show. As far as the presentation goes, it looks and sounds pretty good all around. With the exception of the handling of the final boss. If you somehow made it this far, you're treated to something dramatic. The score tally at the end of the penultimate stage doesn't have sound effects, and the fight screen doesn't have music. It's all silent as the final battle approaches. And then, at the most dramatic moment, this ungodly crap organ music starts blaring and ruins all of it. I'm especially frustrated with this because the finale of Ultra 7 is my favorite ending in the entire franchise. Its usage of Robert Schumann's Allegro Affettuoso is incredibly moving. Ultra 7 and But in this video game adaptation, it's reduced to this garbled mess of organ noises. When I say the music in this game is a decent facsimile of the score from the show, this is an exception. It was so close to getting it right, but this rendition of the song just sucks. It also goes without saying that this game is quite hard. I can get through it just fine because I've played it more than I'd like to admit, but certain fights here just aren't fun. The fight against Dolly is the first big wall of the game. You can't reflect any of his projectiles, you can get all turned around if his dive attack lands behind you, and it does absurd damage. It's just not fair. But yeah, out of all the three games here, Ultra 7 is easily the most polished. It's a guilty pleasure because it gets so much of the necessary presentation down and it doesn't play as badly. There's even a versus mode, which isn't the most polished, but you can drag someone in to play with you if you really want. Weirdly enough, the legacy of these three games doesn't end here. The gimmick of finishing off the opponent with a highly powered special attack crossed over into the Ultraman Fighting Evolution games. And those games are awesome. Fighting Evolution 3 especially. In that one, you have to finish the opponent off with a special move. It can be any tier you want. The 2004 PS2 Ultraman game kinda brought this idea back. You don't have to finish the opponent off with a special move, but over time your meter builds up and you can do a more powerful special move. Go play that one. It's really fun. It's probably my favorite Ultraman game. Don't bother with the Super Nintendo trilogy unless you're really, really curious. Oh yeah, um, here's a little secret. If you're trying to play the first two games, uh, pressing start and select unlocks a options menu where you can turn down the difficulty. I didn't know this when I started recording, so I had to deal with it at normal mode. But yeah, thanks for making it to the end of the video. Here is a readout of my top patrons. Komen, Queer Kaiju, Radiant GV, Chronicler Waba, Alcoholic Alligators, Ryan Santa Cruz, Avak Robot, The Antagonist, Richard Ciavardon, Ziggy Zigra, It's God Z, Big Odilo, An Actual Demetrodon, CMG, Red Comet Harry, and Marpzilla. Thank you very much. The next video will probably be about Ultraman Taro.